life you've been searching for peace, joy, happiness. And some of you are searching for purpose and meaning in your life, and you haven't found it. You can have the greatest hope and courage and joy and thrill that you've ever known if you just let Christ come in right now. Jesus Christ identifies with you, and he looks at you tonight, and he loves you. You start out with a little bit of faith. It may be a shaky, wobbly faith. But if it's in the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have to have faith enough to hold on to him. He'll hold you. He gives you a joy and a peace and a security and an assurance and a happiness and a sense of belonging and fulfillment. God is love. God so loves the world that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you've done, God loves you. What Christ has done for this farm boy, Christ can do for you. What began with Billy Graham's simple decision to follow Jesus Christ ultimately led to an exciting journey of faith with international impact. All over the world, the people have a difference in the way they react and respond, but not to the gospel. When the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed, I just cannot see any difference because man's heart is really the same the world over. The word gospel means good news. Good news that God loves man. God chose me, I think, to be an evangelist, which really is a communicator of one simple message that God loves you and that Christ died for you. And my job is to go and present Christ to those people whose hearts God has prepared. I'm looking forward to that day when I'll see Christ face to face. Are you? Does he live in your heart now? Born in his parents' home in 1918, William Franklin Graham was raised on the family dairy farm just outside Charlotte, North Carolina, as the son of devout Christians. I remember that I didn't care anything about God or religion or hell or the devil or anything else. I was just a carefree kid having a big time doing everything else that every other high school kid was doing. One day I came in from playing baseball and my mother asked me if I would go to church with her that night. She said, well, a powerful man is going to preach tonight. And I went. And I was looking out, listening intently to what he had to say, when all of a sudden he pointed back in my direction and he said, young man, you're a sinner. When the invitation was given, I just said, Lord, I'm going. He says, oh, mother, says the Lord has saved me tonight, says I know it. We knew then that the Lord had really gotten a hold of him. It changed the whole direction of my life. And then about three or four years later, I felt called to preach. Wanting to know more about God's word, Billy convinced his parents to let him leave the farm he grew up on and attend the Florida Bible Institute. But in the years that followed, Billy began to wrestle with the direction his life was taking, not sure he wanted to be a preacher, but not knowing which way to turn. It was a full moonlight night that I'll never forget. It seemed to me that the Spirit of God just came into my heart in a tremendous surge of power. And I knelt down right there and I said, Lord, I'll be what you want me to be and I'll do what you want me to do and I'll never change. This was a pivotal moment Billy would reaffirm in his heart for decades to come. I believe that the Bible teaches that God has given some people the gift of a teacher, some the gift of a pastor, and some the gift of an evangelist. And I believe that God gave me the gift of an evangelist. It was a calling to take the message of hope in Jesus Christ with boldness to anyone who would listen. And it began in small churches and revival meetings. I would prepared uh, four sermons I remember the first time I ever preached in a church and I thought each one would last 45 minutes and I preached all four of them in eight minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but Billy worked hard and practiced. Two of Billy's spiritual mentors at the Bible school recognized his emerging gift for preaching and after his graduation there encouraged him to pursue his studies at a larger college. It was at Wheaton College outside of Chicago where God stirred the young man's heart with a whole new appreciation for the Bible, honing his skills in Bible study and preaching, disciplines that would serve Billy Graham for the rest of his ministry. And it was at Wheaton where Billy was enlightened about the needs of people beyond the borders of America, due in part to a young lady who was raised in China. Ruth Bell was the charming daughter of Dr. Nelson and Virginia Bell, who had been medical missionaries in China. 
It was there that Ruth was born and spent her first 17 years, and where God ignited a flame of compassion in her heart for people all over the world. She was a new student at Wheaton College when Billy arrived on campus. Well, I remember when I first saw him, and he was dashing down the steps of Blanchard uh, two at a time, and my impression was there goes a young man in a hurry. This man that ran the furniture truck I began to tell me about this girl from China. And then when I finally saw her, I was frightened to death to ever ask her for a date. But I finally worked up enough courage to ask her to go at Christmas time to, to the Messiah. And mind you, I didn't even know the man. But I just prayed and I said, Lord, if you will let me share his life, I will consider it the greatest honor possible. Fortunately, I didn't know what lay ahead. I wouldn't have had the nerve to pray a prayer like that. Billy and Ruth married in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina on August 13, 1943, and formed a partnership in life and ministry that served as Billy's anchor for 63 years. The first time I saw her, I fell in love with her, and I knew she was the one I was going to marry. Love at first sight. <laughs> and there were three in our marriage. There was the Lord, and there was Ruth and me. It was a love relationship. My mother loved my father, and my father loved and adored her. And it was a partnership. Of course, she's a great student of the Bible and uh, was a real good advisor. She was perhaps his first advisor. There wouldn't be a Billy Graham without Ruth Graham. I said yes to Jesus Christ, and I remember that I put that in the scales. And for the first time in my life, the scales balanced. In the 1940s, as Billy Graham began his evangelistic ministry, he recruited several talented colleagues to help. No one was more valued than Ruth, who was rarely in public view, but was an active advisor to Billy behind the scenes. A team began forming, one that proved to be inspired, as these men served together for decades. He'd written me and asked me to become his gospel singer. And I said to him, you know, the only gospel singer I've ever known about was, was sing a verse or two, then stop and talk a while. Would I have to do that? He chuckled and he said, I hope not. George Beverly Shea, a well-known musician and radio personality, became the beloved soloist for the Crusades. As the music and program director, Cliff Barrows would also host each Billy Graham event and program throughout the years. Friends from high school and trusted colleagues Grady and T.W. Wilson worked behind the scenes to organize the meetings. Long before they enjoyed national prominence, these men held a somewhat impromptu meeting in Modesto, California. It was 1949, just before one of their early crusade events. Bill mentioned to us, he said, you know, we know that evangelists in the past have run into difficulties, have gotten involved in things that have brought disrepute to the cause of Christ. And he said, let's ask God to guard us from making those mistakes. The team decided to hold each other accountable to four virtues, financial accountability, moral integrity, respect for the local church and their pastors, and truth in publicity. It became known as the Modesto Manifesto. And it was through this team that the mission of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association came into focus to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to all they could by every effective means available to them. It was the foundation of integrity that would serve the team well as the ministry expanded beyond their wildest expectations. We were in Augusta, Augusta Georgia. Augusta, Georgia. And along about that time, we, we heard we were going to go to Los Angeles and it's going to be a big tent. Almighty God says there's going to be a judgment day. The first two weeks drew disappointing crowds and the committee of leaders that had invited the crusade to Los Angeles considered ending the events. Then in the third week, popular radio host Stuart Hamblin supported the crusade on his radio broadcast, and more publicity was on the way. One night I went and I saw several photographers and there were several reporters trying to interview me all at one time. And I said, what has happened? Why are you here? They said, you've just been kissed by William Randolph Hearst. The media until now had ignored these events, but with interest from the head of the vast Hearst publishing empire, national coverage was almost instantaneous. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has an answer to every burden that you carry. The crusade was extended from the original plan of three weeks to eight. With this singular event, Billy Graham became a household name. 
It was confirmation of his calling and God's faithfulness. And we're praying that in these days we might see an old-fashioned, heaven-sent, Holy Ghost revival that will sweep our nation from coast to coast. There's a little voice speaking to you now. And even while I'm talking, that little voice is saying, that's what I need. I need Christ. I need God. I'm going to ask you to surrender to that little voice because that little voice is the voice of the Spirit of God. Invitations for Crusades continue to pour in from church groups all across the nation. Here in Times Square, I believe spiritual hunger draws people together like this. The next few decades became a whirlwind of opportunity for Billy Graham. And people have come to visit us from all over America and for that part, all over the world. In 1954, a committee of church leaders in England arranged for a series of crusade meetings in Great Britain. At the time, London was the largest city in the world, but the event was threatened by vocal members in Parliament who didn't want the American evangelist to hold a public event there. After much prayer, God opened the doors. And just as the Los Angeles Crusade created a watershed in America, the London Crusade marked a breakthrough in Billy's international prominence. And we're here to honor and glorify only one person, and that is the man in the glory, Jesus Christ. Total attendance was over two million, culminating with a final meeting in Wembley Stadium. Soon the Billy Graham evangelistic team made their way across Europe to places like Stockholm, Amsterdam, Berlin. The message of this book is the message of God. The Botschaft dieses Buches and Paris. You must receive Christ. And in 1956, into Asia, including India. I'm going to ask you to come and receive him. Hong Kong. Before we can have world peace, we must have peace within our hearts. Japan. For God so loved the world. And eventually, South Korea. I want to talk about the greatest man that ever lived. Over a million people from all over Korea came to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ on almost every continent, from Australia and if you come to, God, to Canada, give your life to Christ in it. to Latin America and beyond. That God loves us. God opened the doors to take the good news into all the world. I think there are millions of people around the world that maybe have never heard of Christ, yet Christ has spoken to their hearts and they're prepared to listen. And my job is to go and present Christ to those people whose hearts God has prepared. As Billy's ministry grew, so did his family. Through the years, the Grahams were blessed with five children. We didn't realize that Daddy was well known or anything, but I guess when, when um, Look Magazine and Time Magazine and Life Magazine would come to the house with Daddy's pictures on the front, we began to realize there's something you know, special here. National prominence brought increased demands on Billy's time, and the call to preach around the world would often keep him on the road and away from his family for several months at a time. Well, sometimes I imagine you feel like a stranger to your own family, don't you? <laughs> uh, well, I really do. The last time I was home, I'd been away seven months. I didn't understand the difficulties that my mother was going through. Saying goodbye to my father, knowing that he's going to be gone not just for a week, but for four months, six months, incredible lady mother i never in my lifetime ever heard her complain never heard her say a negative word about my daddy There's a lot of times i would go down this driveway here with tears in my eyes i didn't want to go because i knew it'd be several weeks or months before i'd see her by the way i want to ask you one question did you go to church last sunday <laughs> could you make it uh, last month <laughs> Did you go last month? Well, you have a winner now. <laughs> Early in his ministry, Billy understood the power of the media to reach more people for Christ. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Hour of Decision. Even hosting a long-running television program and a weekly radio broadcast. Have you received him by a definite act of faith? Billy was a natural television personality. I think Billy went on all those shows because he always was spreading the message. He answered the questions, but it always came back to, Christ is your Savior, Christ loves you. Uh, you've been reading the Bible, I see. You knew about the commandments. Yes, I know. Uh, Ten commandments can be broken in your heart by thought and intent. 
So in that sense, we're all guilty, and that's the reason the Bible says that everybody's a sinner. Even Ed is a sinner. Well, that, that is, <laughs> comes as quite a surprise. They, they, they... <laughs> Though he never sought fame, he saw that his growing recognition gave him an unparalleled opportunity to spread the gospel. What is your purpose? My purpose is to win as many people to him now, and I'm doing it because he ordered us to. He said, go into the whole world and proclaim this message, that God loves people, that he's interested in people, he wants to help them in their present situation, and he wants to save their souls. People often refer to my grandfather as America's pastor, and I think it would be a term like that my grandfather would blush at because he never set out to be that. Reverend William Billy Graham's untiring evangelism has spread the word of God to every corner of the globe and made him one of the most inspirational spiritual leaders of the 20th century. The international attention would also bring in before American presidents and world leaders. Beginning with President Truman, Billy's spiritual counsel was welcomed by every subsequent president in the nation's highest office. I think it's through him that I found myself praying even more than a daily basis. He would be consulted by men and women of power in many countries on matters of faith, a trusted confidant behind the closed doors of leaders. His reputation is above reproach or suspicion. He's been a Christ-like figure. People see him as the, the great evangelist, but there's a warm, personal side to him that we Bushes have been privileged to see. He was a highly intelligent, highly articulate, highly charismatic man of profound faith who was nevertheless a man. He set for himself the highest possible standards. He has epitomized absolute integrity from the uh, public ministry. You're made in the image of God. You were made to glorify God. He's one of the great evangelists of our nation's history. His crusades are legendary. The size of his crowds were magnificent throughout the years uh, because of uh, the message. And without God, there's an empty place in your life that could be filled tonight, right tonight, by a simple surrender to Jesus Christ. I consider the call to the ministry the highest and most marvelous calling in the world because it's an eternal calling. And I wouldn't trade places with any president or any king. God was calling me and I said, Lord, I'll go where you want me to go and I'll be what you want me to be. I'm yours. Our job is to call out a people for his name, confronting the world with the claims of Christ. And that's what we've been doing in our organization. And that's what you've been doing in your churches, scattering seed. And these seeds are seeds of the gospel and they fall upon good ground and bring forth good fruit. Internet evangelism is one of the most successful evangelistic programs that this organization has ever done. When people have questions about spiritual matters or religion, they go online. So it's important to be there with the gospel. The rapid response team chaplains go at a moment's notice into some of the toughest areas of the world to minister the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The peace that Jesus brings just whew, it washes over the, the person we pray with. It's been exciting to see what God has done at the Billy Graham Library. Every day lives are changed. It's about the gospel. We're going to continue our crusades. Tonight you can surrender your life to Jesus Christ and He will forgive you, He'll cleanse you, He'll make you into a new creation. We must prepare the ground and sow the seed of God's Word and water it. What is our message? Christ alone as the Savior of men. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. There is no excuse ever for hatred. There is no excuse ever for bigotry and intolerance and prejudice. We are to love as God loved us. Crossing into uncharted territory, Billy refused to allow intense criticism to keep him from sharing the good news with everyone, regardless of race. But when God looks at you, he doesn't look on the outward appearance. His decision to confront racism and injustice in America and other parts of the world raised the respect of many and the ire of others. This is the 
way, the truth, and the life. Billy had received invitations to preach in South Africa, but refused to do so until he could preach to a non-segregated audience openly challenging apartheid. Christianity is not a white man's religion, and don't let anybody ever tell you that it's white or black. Christ belongs to all people. He belongs to the whole world. And he said to the thousands there, apartheid is sin. It, it's, it's wrong. It, it's, it's, it's not right with God. And the papers carried it. I know that God has sent me out as a warrior to preach the gospel. And I must continue until he gives the signal that I'm to stop. In the height of the Cold War, he and his ministry boldly took their message to the communist Soviet Union, where Christianity had been repressed. The hope lies at the foot of the cross. It helped to undermine the communist system. So I think he was one of the forces that kept the window open to the human spirit. I've traveled over this world a great deal now, and I feel that I'm a part of a great mosaic of the human race uh, that God has created, each made in his image, each needing the gospel of Christ, each having the same basic problems and desires and longings, and I'm a part of that. There are many things about God that I don't understand or comprehend. I accept his revelation of himself by faith. When natural disasters cause devastation, the Billy Graham team reached out to those in need, offering physical and spiritual assistance. Living the word of the gospel in prayer and action, they brought hope during seemingly hopeless times. While we preach the cross with one arm, we also give a cup of cold water with the other. He has often been a healing voice and a calming shepherd bringing comfort and solace to a troubled nation during seasons of crisis. This event reminds us of the brevity and the uncertainty of life. We never know when we too will be called into eternity. My prayer today is that we will feel the loving arms of God wrapped around us and will know in our hearts that He will never forsake us as we trust in Him. I think one of my ministries as I get older is to help advise and counsel younger evangelists and put at their disposal whatever we have learned. As a result of his international experiences, Billy Graham's vision for reaching the world began to broaden. After much prayer, the team began an immense effort to train evangelists and provide resources for them to reach the remote parts of the globe. And I see those hungry, thirsty millions, and I say, oh God, you have said, go into all the world and declare this message. That's our job as evangelists. In 1983, 1986, and again in 2000, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association invited thousands of evangelists to gather in Amsterdam for worship and intense training that brought worldwide impact. Amsterdam 2000 was a phenomenal. And this is one of the things that's come out of Dr. Graham's ministry. It isn't just that millions of people have been won to a faith in Jesus Christ. Also, thousands upon thousands of new evangelists have been born out of his ministry. Sometimes I get so sick of seeing the name Billy Graham as though I'm the whole thing. And I know that it's a work of many people being used of the Lord and offering their special gifts to us. I've heard people say, who's going to replace you, Billy Graham? Over the years, we've had evangelists that have come from around the world for training. And my father has said each time, they are the ones who are going to replace me. It's a privilege for me to be able to present to you my father, Dr. Billy Graham. Daddy. In the late 1980s, Franklin Graham joined his father's ministry. His festivals have traveled the world carrying on Billy's mission of proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ. Back on your sin tonight and come by faith to his son, Jesus Christ. God will put his arms around you. He'll say, welcome home. In the years that followed, Billy spent less time in the public eye and more time writing. Until his last crusade in New York in 2005, drawing almost 200,000 people. I go to prepare a place for you, said Jesus. 
and where I am, there you can be also. Throughout his ministry, Ruth had been Billy's constant companion, even when they were far apart. They shared their later years together in love and prayer in the home she had built for them until her passing in June of 2007. I love her very much, and I thank God for such a wonderful Christian wife who stood by me all these years as I've traveled all over the world proclaiming the gospel. So it hasn't been all that hard sticking beside him. <laughs> it's been nothing but pure joy. Uh, most of the time it's been pure joy. <laughs> I say 98% 90, of the time. There's 2% she's not sure about. <laughs> I'll try to find out what that is. The 2% <laughs> make it interesting. <laughs> There's hope, there's joy, there's purpose, there's meaning. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I've become an old man now, and I've preached all over the world. And the older I get, the more I cling to that hope that I started with many years ago. And I have confidence as I stand before God at this moment that there's nothing between me and the Savior because Christ has forgiven my sins. And it brings a great joy and a great peace to me because I know where I've come from. I know why I'm here, I know where I'm going. And I don't have any doubts about it. Wherever you are, whoever you are, rich, poor, black, white, whatever your color, race, or creed, you can say yes to Jesus Christ. You and you alone in the quiet arena of your heart, we'll have to make that decision. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. That's going to be a great occasion. And I'm looking forward to seeing Christ face to face and seeing old friends again and living the life that the Bible describes so beautifully. God loves you. I'm asking you tonight to commit your life to Jesus Christ. You can have joy and peace and happiness in your life such as you've never known. I would like to be considered a person who had integrity and who was faithful to his calling and who loved God with all his heart, mind, and soul. Beginning with a simple expression of faith at age 15, speaking around the world with clarity and conviction, Billy Graham's ministry has delivered the message of hope in Jesus Christ throughout the world for over 80 years. Now, through the millions whose lives were changed by Christ, that ministry lives on. Now I'm going to live a billion years, and I'll only have begun.